To say you gotta know somebody Or know somebody To get somewhere these days To say you know that's alright Yeah, that's alright know all the tools so you know when to use them and when not to use them. You know, and I'd say sitting with a banker is a great idea to see where you're at financially yourself with the Fannie Mae rules. Just to know where you're at. You know, to see where your strength is as a Fannie Mae buyer. Does that mean you need to use Fannie Mae loans to buy your real estate? Absolutely not. And I'd be more than willing to sit with anybody. I'm not here to promote myself today. I'm here to teach. But if anyone ever wants a piece of my time to see where you sit, I'd be more than happy to show you. And it's not a mystery. You know, a lot of people, how many people when they bought their first house looked at the paperwork and were like, oh my God, I understand nothing and I'm signing all this stuff. I mean, everybody does it. I'll be honest with you. I've bought and sold only about 14 properties in my life. But I bought a second home two years ago, and I got the heebie-jeebies before I went to closing. I think I told you that. <laughs> a week before closing, I thought, oh my God, what the hell am I doing? I was buying a second home, and I bought the house, and I don't know why, but you know, even people in the industry, not except for Henry's an exception, but even people in the industry can get a little schizoid about a deal. The buyer's anxiety? Yeah. I never call it heebie-jeebies. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they are. It happens. Sure. That's the Fannie Mae term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the official, that's yeah. official Fannie Mae term. But I uh, can't think of anything else I can go over other than credit. But if you guys are here, you know, the stronger your credit, the better your rates. The strong, in fact, it, you know, you need to, to be an investor in the Fannie Mae world. You want to try to be above 700, but you can be in the sixes. You just won't get the best interest rates. Be honest with you. you know so if you ever need the credit counseling I also offer that it's free of charge I can always run someone's credit and tell them what to do to fix it too. Uh, you decide to partner with Roger this summer. Does that change any of your comments or acting? Absolutely your... not. You're co-borrowers. <coughs> Absolutely not. You're, in fact I have a partner on four of my houses. We're co-borrowers. We're both on mortgage, we're both on deeds, and we're both on you know when we do our tax returns we do the return on the house, on the Schedule E, chop it in half, she takes half, I take that. You know, it's just, it's a, just like buying a house, you know, for all intents and purposes. If you bought your house for your wife, it's the same way. Can I break down the rates for the credit score category that you just described, 600? Well, I mean, I would prefer an investor come to me with at least a 680 credit score. And if 680 credit score right now on investment property, let's just throw a fictitious rate out there is at 4.75. A 740 or better is going to be about 4.375. About three eighths better. I know you well. Give me four of them. Right now. There's your man. No one can do that. I can't hold on to it. No, so, you know, you're probably between the best and worst rates, you're probably talking three eighths, maybe a half percent interest rate between the two. You know, and, and to be honest with you, as an investor, you want to be rate conscious, but if your renters are paying, are paying the mortgage, I'm not as rate conscious as I did commercial loans on a bunch of my properties that started out at 7%. I didn't care. Rents being paid by the, by the I don't look to get rich off my rents, I look to build the equity in the home. So if my tenants are paying the mortgage, so be it. And those that what was great is they were just worried mortgages and they dropped. Four of my houses were on a blanket. I was paying eleven twenty-five and that is down to seven hundred and twelve dollars. Sweet. Because I bought them before the crash and then when Prime dropped, my my mortgage dropped, which was real nice. Yeah. That still kills me. I was I wasn't in the business when they were in the twelves. And I was happy to get there. Yeah. And I looked at you going, it's three or four percent on that. We've drifted into the fours now, and all their friends and family got threes last year. They were in the threes last year. You have no idea 
How many heads I want to crush when they argue with me that they should be a three and a quarter? I just, it just drives me nuts. True, true happiness is when Carter just recorded. Yeah. Did you, when you were happy to get When my parents were first looking to buy back in the early 80s, they were at 18%. Sure. Yeah. In fact, that's when that my brother got the business. That was a good break. Early 80s. Yeah. Yeah. You can, I've actually yeah, read, I in, <laughs> I've actually read in, a, in an investing book by Dolph DeBruce. If anybody ever read Real Estate Riches, a pretty, pretty well known book. He recommended buying houses when the rates were 18%, as much of them as he, as he could. And the, and the reason behind it was is because the rates were so high, nobody was buying anything. Nobody could justify putting a deal together. So he went out and bought tons of them, knowing right well that there's no way the rates were going to stay at 18%. Well, a couple of years later, when the rates went down to 9 he refied them all in a giant blanket, and all of a sudden he got all these amazing deals. Real estate prices started popping. His cash flow freaking quadrupled. So there's a way to make money in this business no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening. And that's what I was trying to say about rate consciousness. As long as you're within the average rate of the day, you, know, you can fight for an eighth all you want. It's not going to change your life. Now, I mean, on your primary, maybe people get a little more because they're paying that mortgage. But when you're out in the lending world, you can go through a heartache like this gentleman did with a lender who doesn't know how to handle investors because he may show a good rate. You can go to lending tree, God forbid, and try to get an investment property through lending tree. Good luck, you know, and things of that nature. So you want, the, especially in the investment world, you want to build a network of people you trust. You want to build a network of people you can work with. And they know you, you know them. And it makes it so much easier. I think that's all I go. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, I just wondering uh, if you have come up some recommendation. What, what, how many, uh, which banks invest friendly? Like you say, I don't want to go to the Well, there's a choice. Well, it's not <laughs> friendly. All banks want to write loans for investors. They all do it. You want to have a loan officer who is seasoned and knows how to do the job. A lot of loan officers in our business, and these guys are realtors, they know. There's a lot of loan officers in our business. They're order takers. They know how to put it onto the computer. They don't understand the theory behind it. They don't understand how to fight the underwriter. I've fought underwriters and won. I have. I've fought underwriters on rules and won because I read the book. And there's a Bible that comes out every quarter. Fannie, Freddie, and FHA put out a book every quarter with changes. I read them. You know, if I have a question on a mortgage, I go to the book before I go to the underwriter. And if the underwriter says no and I show her in the book, I mean, I'm not always right, but I have beat them once or twice out of maybe 50 times. But I love that one or two victory that I've had, especially because it's my sister in law. <laughs> Any more questions? No docs. Uh, there is no no docs. <laughs> yeah, there is. yeah, there is, but I don't do them. Actually, I do have one no doc product, but no doc. There was such a thing where you didn't have to show your income. It was called stated income. There are. There's only one bank that I know that's doing it. I heard they're getting rid of it. It's Hudson City. Hudson City. And I think that's going because there's a rule called QRM, and the banks have to follow QRM, or they're hit with that portfolio, of the extra um, reserves. So I honestly think you're not going to see too much no doc. Do you have a, a, a product that has a property standalone? In other words, the rents have been there for two years. Can I use that as income on that property and, and that mortgage? Is it on your tax return? I don't write to the income of the property. I write to the income of the individual's tax return. Mm -hmm. Is the best way to answer that. So you get all the income, not yes. the income of the property. Yes. Correct. Yes. That's exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> Asset-based loans were popular one time. They just don't do them anymore. You know, e even average um, deposits in your checking account one time was considered. A way to do a loan, they don't do them anymore. You know, they should say 12 months. So people don't have jobs that they get more. Right. It's a shame. It's a positive graph, though. Discrimination. <laughs> yes.
Um, <laughs> debt to income, let's say I just, I'm just a new investor, I just bought on um, rental property. How much seasoning is needed for rent in my experience? They, uh, you must have missed it. Sorry. Experience has been limited. It, actually, say you rent the property before you close. And I've had a client do this. They actually had it rented before they bought it. All I have to show is a lease, a deposit from the renter in their bank account, you know, a copy of the check, and a corresponding deposit in the bank account, and I can use rents for that property prior to closing. Still? Wow. Yeah. How do they, how they do that? I mean, it's just, well, just from what you give you an example, or how, how, how is that crafted? Well, sometimes people buy in neighborhoods they know very well, and they have family in those neighborhoods, and they have friends in those neighborhoods, and hey, I just bought the house over on, uh, you know, Party Road, and, you know, or, or like someone will find out they're buying the investment property friend and say, you know what, I want to rent it from you. They write a lease, they give them a check for a security deposit, boom, it's done. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Some people actually uh, might put it up on Craigslist that the house, they're going to buy the house, it's closing in January, and uh, I'd like to have a renter by February, and it can happen. I mean, again, Will the listing agent let you show it to a future renter? That's something you got to work out with your realtors. That's why I use the realtor knows investment properties because I always put that in the clause that the that the buyer can show the property while it's under contract to prospective renters. And that's very important. So yes, it you is possible. Have rented, you'll have it rented before you close. If you're if you're good at marketing and good at answering your phone and get, getting it out there that you're buying this property, you can get prospective renters. There's no question. Especially in a desirable area. So it is another thing to look at if you're a little debt to income shy. Right. I don't think we've covered pretty much the gambit. Can anybody else think of anything that I did not talk about? Yes, sir. For the new lending rules, is there anything important that might affect the uh, trade? Well, no, because actually the new closing rules aren't lending rules. Fair enough. So the settlement rules and the lending rules. Yeah, the settlement up. rules, there are some, I actually, I haven't had my training on that yet, believe it or not. Oh, I have. <laughs> uh, at closing, there's going to be some changes. I don't know if it affects your world, does it? Was it the Try it. it really yeah, it's still going to affect your world. Sure. Well, it's not going to be hard money. Mm, why would it? Well, it's, it's, yeah, it will affect his world, too. At closing. Hard money lender? Yeah, what, so well, at closing, things there's some things that can't change the day of closing. Otherwise, you have to stop. Nah, it's just going to put a lot of hard money lenders out of business. You think? Yeah, nah, actually, it's not work. It's our money. <laughs> huh? like, it's effectively our money for handing it. Oh no, no, no! It's not affecting the fact that you can lend. It's it's at closing. A closing won't happen if the HUD changes mm -hmm. certain ways. No HUD anymore. Huh? No HUD anymore. I know, I know. I just call it HUD. So what are they going to call, call it? Closing, closing. All right, closing. This can make the closing disclosure, and the loan may not close so for another three days afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you know what we're talking about? Something. It's not important. Just know that. Just know you need to have good people walking walk through it. Because yes. After October, there are, there are this are whole business that, changes. There are problems that can happen if you don't do everything correctly. You know, we've changed procedures in our office to make sure that nothing can happen. I've shown these procedures to title companies, and they're like, "Can we borrow this and give it to other agencies?" Yeah, our bank's already rolled out on it. Um, we have an assist, it's up in our systems. They just don't let us touch it yet because they uh, want to do it all at the same time. Okay. Bill? Well, I mean, the one thing I would say in closing about Tom is you can tell he's, he's a smart guy and he knows his business. I can't even count the number of clients that I meet as a realtor and they tell me, uh, Oh, they're waiting for this loan to get done for two or three months, and I always tell them, look, go see Tom. It doesn't cost you anything. You give the guy a call, you go sit down with him, and he'll tell you straight up what the deal is. And maybe you, you got, he sends you away, and you got to go make some changes to your credit or whatever, and you come back. But the man gets the deals done. And isn't that what, what you're doing this for, right? You want to you get, get your money. You want to be able to do a real estate deal. If you can't, the loan officer doesn't get the job done for you, you're going to lose the deal. So it's critical you work with somebody that you can trust and who's going to get it done. And this guy has been getting it done for me for a very long time. You know, it's not me. I probably have one of the best teams in the industry. I have underwriters in my office. Anybody who's going through the loan process, your underwriter's usually somewhere in Texas or Indiana or God knows where. 
my underwriters are in my office, my processors are in my office. If I have a question, I can go to the underwriter's office and walk into her office, put your file down, and sit with her. Most law officers can't do that. No. I'll say only maybe 10% or less law officers can physically talk to an underwriter. Most of the time they have to email it and maybe get a response back to it a few days later. That's huge. And that's, that's what makes me good. It's not just me, it's my team. I have one of the best law teams in the business. Far none. So this is all in-house, you're not brokering? No, I'm a bank. We fund our own mortgages. Yes, we sell them, but we do fund our own mortgages. And uh, we underwrite, we do it all. From soup to nuts, right in the office, right down the street. I'm in South, you know, I'm in Southampton. Street Road and Second Street Pike. There's a little street Grove Avenue right before Second Street Pike. My office is right there. In-house underwriting. In-house underwriting. I have 200, 200 writers in-house, four processors, post-closing. It's all done from my office. That's pretty rare. Yeah, that's pretty rare. It's very rare. It's very rare. Here's a here's a a tip for anybody buying a house anywhere, whether it's a primary or, or anything. Always ask the mortgage company if they have in-house underwriting. If they say no, say thank you very much. I'm not asking. You already got a guy. Always in-house.